Hi, welcome back to the second half of Session 11, Pirate Smugglers in the Making of the Modern World. In the first half, we've looked at a couple of examples of smuggling involving consumer or consumer-related products, products that were banned or heavily taxed by protectionist regimes in much of the world after 1945. Things like cigarettes, gold, diamonds, some of these even though they appear to be sort of luxury items from exotic trades of the past, nevertheless had very practical uses, particularly diamonds and gold, because of course they did serve as a means of securing one's savings in these countries with unstable uh, exchange rates and often unstable economies. Now we're going to move uh, in the same direction, but look at a product that more clearly people can identify as purely and simply a consumer item and one whose demand increases rapidly in the years after World War II. It doesn't carry the stigmas of cigarettes and whiskey, that they're sort of uh, considered sin products that should be heavily taxed at the same time. They're not the exotic items of gold and diamonds. It's simply watches. Now, a watch was certainly early in the 20th century a luxury item, but as we proceed, and particularly by the time we reach the middle of the 20th century, there are still, even today of course, luxury watches. You can buy a watch for 15, 20, 25, 30 thousand dollars, as much as your wallet can possibly afford. But the fact is, for most people, and particularly in the 1950s and 60s, this was becoming the reality. For most people, it's a simple, basic consumer item of convenience. And this was what was happening in the years that we're looking at, and we're going to see how this becomes a major item for smuggling. And it really foretells the kind of smuggling that we're going to look at next week in the following decades when every conceivable uh, consumer item from Walkman to DVD players to uh, sneakers, etc., will become items of smuggling. And we're also going to look, in the latter part of today, at controlled substances and how these become an important part of the smuggling process, particularly in this country after 1945, and of the correlation between the international effort to control the use of certain substances and the increase of smuggling. And we will also follow over time, through this week and into next week, how many of these substances, such as marijuana, that were smuggled on a sort of amateur basis, a casual basis uh, for the most part, increasingly come to be controlled by criminal syndicates because as government enforcement increases, the risks go up. Therefore, one, people are going to have to be inclined to take the risk of going to jail for an extended period, which usually criminal syndicates are, as opposed to a casual smuggler who simply wants to make a little bit of money here and there. And secondly, as enforcement proce procedures are enhanced, you're going to need capital to overcome those procedures. If it remained amateur hour in the smuggling of marijuana or other products, they probably wouldn't get into the country because they wouldn't be able to overcome the various technologies and enforcement techniques that I begin to be implemented during this period, but particularly uh, in the last quarter of the 20th century. So we're going to look at both of these aspects of smuggling from 1945 to 1975. Now, as far as watches, as uh, an item that was going from being a luxury item to a consumer item, it's a little bit difficult for people who were born in the last 30, 35 years uh, to understand exactly what's going on here because most of us are used to digital watches by now uh, and the idea of a wind-up watch you know, has pretty much gone out the window. Even watches that appear to be you know, sort of classic wind-up watches are in fact electronically driven. But in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the ancient period of history, uh, the key to a wind-up watch, a dial watch, was simply the movement inside, the springs and dials that made the watch function effectively. And the most efficient and effective mechanisms were being made in Switzerland. And what was known as the Swiss movement was this set of devices which were used to power to regulate wristwatches at this time. And watch manufacturers across the world were using the Swiss movement if they wanted to make any type of quality watch. Again, the price of the watch may vary significantly depending upon exactly 
how high the quality of the specific movement and what the other components in terms of the crystal, the band, and the case are. So you could have extremely expensive watches, inexpensive watches, but most manufacturers wanted to get their hands on Swift's movements as the core of the watch itself. So when we talk about smuggling watches, what are being smuggled are these Swiss movements, are the inner guts, if you will, of a watch. Very basic, what's becoming a very basic consumer item is something that is going to be smuggled on a large scale throughout the world. Now, not surprisingly, watches again were going to come under the control of various protectionist regimes. In India, they use quota and licensing systems to control the import of watches. And why? Again, it's simple. We could be making these at home. Why do we want to spend our precious resources on importing them? We want to limit the imports and encourage local manufacturers to produce the watch in its entirety and not to be importing the central inner core. We don't want to be spending foreign exchange on a basic consumer item. We want to be building industry at home. Now, that, of course, immediately leads to the smuggling of watches. And we see in this case, as with cigarette smoking, that statistics, import statistics, help us understand where the centers of smuggling of the Swiss movements was going on. Uh, watch consumption per 100 residents. And by that, we mean how many watches are being imported each year into these locations. It's how many watches per 100 residents. In Hong Kong, Hong Kong is importing 31 watches per 100 residents a year. Lebanon, 39. You get to the United Arab Emirates, they're importing 1,611 watches per 100 people. And in Kuwait, it's 106. Panama, a measly 26. If we take the extreme of the Arab Emirates, we're looking at importing 16 watchers per person every year. In other words, people in the Arab Emirates would be, have to be flipping off a watch every three days and throwing it away in order to justify these import statistics. So the extremes of the large number of watches coming in tell us that these places per capita, tell us that these places are centers for the smuggling of watch movements. And again, it's the usual list of suspects. Hong Kong is right there, Lebanon, Kuwait, Panama, in this case, the United Arab Emirates. Why? Because almost in every case here, we have a free port, a free zone, where goods can readily be brought in, untaxed, shipped out again untaxed, and on top of that, there is relatively limited inspection of international cargoes coming and going, because the idea is that a free port not only frees you of taxes, but frees you of the very slow process of customs inspection that normally inhibits trade in traditional port systems. So again, the free ports are an ideal location, just as they are an ideal location for smuggling cigarettes, uh, whiskey, and other products, so too with watches at this time. Now, the smuggling business in watches is again uh, connected to ethnic groups and to families because the watch trade itself, like so many other international trading items, is largely controlled by family groups among ethnic groups that have migrated, particularly in the 20th century. And again, we could talk about some of the same groups. There are various groups from Eastern Europe and Asia and elsewhere. People have had to migrate because of political persecution, uh, ethnic persecution, economic instability, political instability. They take advantage of that. It becomes an opportunity, in fact, because relatives have had to migrate. Now you have contacts in America and South America and elsewhere. You can use those people to establish your trade, to trade in watch movements, Swiss movements. And most of it is legitimate. And most of these people spend most of their time engaged in the legitimate trade of Swiss movements and the manufacture of watches in their domestic economies. Also, the, the legal trade, besides the fact that you've got these uh, family connections that help reinforce it, you can trust, usually, family members not to cheat you, because what are you going to do if they cheat you again in a smuggling operation? Can't really appeal to the police. Not only do these family connections strengthen that, but the legitimacy of most of the trade helps cover the smuggling of watches, because for those who do engage in smuggling, they have an inventory of legitimate watches. If they add a couple of hundred more here or there, if the police customs officials come to inspect their inventory, they can always explain that, well, gee, I just haven't shipped these watches yet. Uh, 
but the possibility that the police or anyone else can track down the source of watches that for the most part are legitimate is pretty limited. So given the fact that 90% of what you're doing on a daily basis is a legitimate trade in watch movements, the fact that only 10% is smuggled gives you a great opportunity to hide the smuggled watches and to move them around in a legitimate trade and incorporate them into that legitimate trade in a relatively short time. So the legitimate trade, which is most of what's going on, is a great hiding place for the illegitimate trade, which some people are engaged in. Now, the smuggling of watches was largely done, or the Swiss movements was largely done by airlines. Uh, the watch movements aren't that heavy. It's not like gold. You don't have to train couriers how to walk around with a 40-pound vest on. They simply gather up a few hundred movements, uh, maybe even five, six, seven, eight hundred movements, put them in a briefcase, and get on a plane and try to smuggle them in. Now, of course, you know, this problem of what if they open up you know, the briefcase and now you're caught seems like a good possibility. Uh, there are several ways of dealing with this. Uh, one was used although this was less frequent because uh, luxury liners were not used as often, partly because Swiss movements didn't have the same kind of per unit value as, let us say, gold, diamonds. So it was less worthwhile to put somebody on a ship for, let's say, a week in order to move them. You want to move them faster uh, on a plane. But when they did use luxury liners, uh, what they would do is essentially take them over, put them in their cabin, then sit in the vessel, waiting for the vessel to turn around and go home. And in the meantime, when luxury liners were in port, there were inevitably visitors' days where people could come and visit you and stop on board and see you before you returned. You'd stay on the vessel. One of your friends would come on board as a visitor, pick up the valise with the watches in it, and walk off. And nine times out of ten, there would not be a customs inspector there. This was too Mickey Mouse, so to speak, for them to get involved in. So that was one way. A more elaborate plan I uh, had to do with the airlines, and this is where most of the smuggling went on. In this case, the courier, let us say, gets on a plane in Lisbon, Portugal, and he has a briefcase full of watches. Gets on the plane, plane is up over the Atlantic flying to New York. He leaves his seat, takes his briefcase with him, goes back to the washroom. At the back of the sink, or underneath the sink, there's usually a repair panel where you can unscrew the panel and get in to repair pipes and repair leaks takes his bag of watch movements, puts it in the repair space, closes it up, goes back to his seat, plane lands in New York. Courier gets off. Plane continues to L.A. The courier, meanwhile, books another flight from New York to L.A. When he gets to L.A., he then books the return flight going back to New York. In this case, he books the flight, which is using the same piece of equipment on which he left the watches in the first place. Now, how does he know which one is the 727-707 that's going back to New York that he flew in from Lisbon on? He knows because they have paid off an airline official to give them information on the use of their equipment. It's a, virtually a non-risk operation if someone in airline scheduling provides you with that information. What's the harm? You give them a little bit of information and you make a few dollars. This is how he knows which plane is going to be the same piece of equipment that he flew over across the Atlantic on. Gets on that plane in LA, plane is up over the United States, he goes back to the washroom, opens the panel, takes out the Swiss movements, puts them back in his briefcase, lands in New York, he's on a domestic flight, nobody's going to check him for customs. There are no customs inspections when you're getting off a flight from LA to New York. He walks out and the Swiss movements have been smuggled in. These are the kinds of stealth operations that could be used to move watches and why they could be so readily smuggled. They had a reasonable high value, not that of gold or diamonds, and at the same time, relatively small size. They could be smuggled with relative ease and, of course, using airliners with great speed. Now, having looked at some of the types of products and ways that things were being smuggled, in the period 1945 to 1975, we also want to look at what are some of the other factors. We've looked at the sort of macro picture of protectionist regimes and why they help lead to smuggling because, of course, they put up barriers to basic consumer items, cigarettes, whiskey, watches, etc. 
and that helps create the process of smuggling as well as the existence of free zones. But what are some of the other factors that are operative at this time for this part of international smuggling, the part of international smuggling that had to do primarily with consumer or consumer-related products? Among those influencing factors, uh, the existence of one-party regimes in much of the developing world or the third world. As countries emerged from colonialism, many of them were dominated by the political movement that helped bring about independence in the first place. When you look at Africa, you look at Asia, you look at places like India, Indonesia, uh, you see that the party of independence, the movement that helped bring about independence, that fought off colonial rule, usually establishes itself as the dominant party. It's a one-party regime. Now, there may be other political parties. India certainly has a plethora of other political parties at this time. But this one party has the dominant role. It controls 70 or 80 percent of the Congress, you know, the 70 or 80 percent of the national bureaucracy, etc. It has a virtual monopoly on political power. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because in political systems without a viable opposition, one that has some serious chance of taking power. There is virtually no control on government corruption. No matter what we may say about, well, we have all of these laws, whether it's the United States or other countries, that you have laws against corruption, et cetera, and you have a judicial system, that's fine. But in the political process, acts of corruption, acts of political crime, shall we say, are not going to be intensely prosecuted. They're not even going to be brought to the public eye unless there is a viable political opposition. I mean, when something wrong is being done by the regime in power, they're not going to go out and tell the public just how awful they are. It's going to take the loyal opposition in the legislature and to bring up this issue to call for investigations and to try to clean up the process. Eventually, of course, members of the ruling party will throw themselves wholeheartedly into this to prove that they're not all corrupt, etc. But the harsh reality is that if you are in a one-party regime, there is little practical control over corruption because there is no one to blow that whistle. And ruling party members are not going to be the ones to do that. And as a result, the existence of so many one-party regimes in much of the developing world was an inducement to corruption, and this meant an inducement to smuggling. I mean, if you can readily bribe an official, and chances are very low that either you or that official in particular will ever be brought to justice, will ever be accused of a crime, then, of course, that kind of corruption is going to be rampant. And indeed, it was in most of these one-party regimes. An example that I offer here is from Ghana. Ghana was, uh, at one time, the British uh, African colony known as the Gold Coast. However, in the late 1950s, Kwame Nkrumah led a movement known as the Convention People's Party uh, that helped bring down colonial rule in the Gold Coast and helped by the end of the 1950s to make it an independent nation known as Ghana. Kwame Nkrumah and the Convention People's Party then immediately assumed the role that I've just described in so much of the Third World, where they were the predominant political force in the country for years to come. There was an opposition, but it was not really a viable opposition. Another one where it's one that could readily hope to take over political power in any time in the foreseeable future. Uh, Nkrumah had a trade minister named uh, Mr. Jin, uh, and he was, not surprisingly, uh, taking bribes for import licenses. Ghana was following the same kind of strategy I outlined last week, and one of, part of that strategy is to license the import of products uh, to ensure that foreign exchange is not spent excessively on products that are not really needed for economic development. Of course, if you want to get that product into the country anyways, you need a license. To get the license, in this case, you're going to have to pay Mr. Jin a bribe, or at least some people did. Um, it was an uneven process. It was more or less uh, those who were willing to go to an extreme and pay money. He was more than willing to issue licenses to them in return. Now, there were complaints about this. Uh, 
partly from the bribe payers because the prices were going up and they were getting tired of the prices constantly going up to pay for licenses. And uh, the Nkrumah government did feel it needed to respond to what was a widely perceived sense of scandal in the country over this. And as a result, a new minister, Kwesi Adama, uh, was put in charge of the trade ministry. And he did change things. Uh, he formalized the bribery process so that now everyone paid a 10% bribe. In other words, if the license originally cost, let us say, 500 British pounds, uh, now you also pay 50 British pounds as the bribe. Uh, so what we got was not an end to corruption. We simply got a systemization, a standardization of corruption, so everybody was paying the same thing. I'm sure much better instead of competitive bidding for the licenses. But again, you've got a one-party regime. You're not going to expect to get a real cleanup in the operation as a result of that because there is not enough political pressure to bring real change when this kind of thing happens. And this was an epidemic of corruption throughout much of the third world at this time that was allowing smuggling to go on simply by bribing local officials for things like import licenses. Now, as I mentioned, India... Uh, had a similar political situation. The Congress Party uh, under Mahatma Gandhi had first brought India to independence uh, in 1947, uh, had helped overthrow British rule, rule. Gandhi himself, of course, although he would be assassinated soon after independence, was an icon uh, of Indian nationalism and the Congress Party uh, shared in that glory. And as a result, the Congress Party clearly dominated the entire political system. As a result, there's widespread corruption. An indication of this, because of course corruption is always hard to pin down if you're going to talk about statistics and numbers, how many people are doing it, how much is being paid. It's like the smugglers themselves, they're not going to keep the books on this because it's illegal. But an indication of this is that when import duties were increased in India, and they periodically were throughout this period, in the decades after World War II, that government revenues didn't increase as a result. Now, there's a possibility, of course, that trade dropped off significantly. You know, if we've increased the import duty, maybe fewer goods are being brought in. But in fact, that was not the case. Uh, these import duty increases did not lead to a diminution, at least in official trade statistics. So if the import duties are not going up, and yet the trade volume remains the same or is increasing. The only explanation is that somebody is bribing an official so they don't have to pay the import duty. The official statistics bespeak that because, again, they show that the duty goes up, trade remains the same, it goes higher, the volume of trade, and yet the amount of revenue coming into the government remains the same. That says people are being paid off so that they don't charge the import duties. Now, aside from the fact that, yes, one-party regimes in developing countries meant that there were significant opportunities for corruption without opportunity for correction. Another factor is that, as with the old trading empires, there is a process of rationalization going on in these systems. And that smuggling is part of that rationalization system. We talked about licensing last time, and we've just seen an example of licensing again in another country, in Ghana. And licensing was used throughout the developing world, throughout hmm, countries that were trying to use import substitution industrialization. And of course, the idea was that you could target specific goods that were being imported and establish, just like with quotas, or similar to quotas, precisely how much of that product was going to be brought in. The problem but the system was this, that you're often dealing with large economies. You look at India, Brazil, Indonesia, you're dealing with countries with enormous and increasingly complex economies where imported goods, aren't, we're not just talking about you know, a few consumer goods, we're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of different items, inputs to all kinds of industrial, telecommunication, uh, financial systems, goods that have to be imported on a daily basis. The problem is, under a quota or licensing system, government bureaucrats have to try to determine how much of that good do we need every year. You know, how many uh, gears for uh, oil drilling equipment do we need each year? And then they have to get out a list of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of items often, and figure out 
exactly how much we're going to allow in of this product. Needless to say, it's almost impossible for them to be accurate with these forecasts and to get them close to getting the number right. In re as a result of this sort of bureaucratic nightmare, and as a result of the additional complications of trying to find out, okay, how much of my product is available this year? Uh, how do I get a license for that? Is that license still going to be available two weeks from now, et cetera? But given the planning problems and the problems of actually acquiring the licenses, smuggling provided a rationalization of the system. It made up for the shortages that were going to occur or the delays that were going to occur in licensing and quota systems. Just as in the old trading empires when trade was tightly controlled and colonists might be starving to death because they couldn't import goods from anywhere but the mother country, smugglers come along and rationalize the process, solve the problem. They bring goods that are needed that are not being admitted by the system. They actually help the system to survive. It's a symbiotic relationship. Smugglers do the same thing in developing economies at this time. They help rationalize the system. They provide the additional input that is needed that is not being allowed in by the licensing system that is needed for the continued growth of the economy. So here we do have a throwback to the past in this sense that in this case, smuggling is again rationalizing a government control system and at the same time, we have a symbiotic relationship that the formal economy with all its controls is really working in close coordination with the smuggling economy in order for the formal economy to work. Another factor besides one-party regimes and sort of rationalizing uh, the controls that were established for purposes of development is that some countries actually came to live on smuggling. Smuggling became a way of achieving economic growth that was otherwise difficult to accomplish in these years. Probably the outstanding example of this is in Paraguay. Paraguay in the 1960s uh, was famous, and it is still famous today, by the way, it's just the products have changed, we'll see that next week, for smuggling goods. It was a very small, poorly developed economy is sitting on the border of two much larger developing economies, namely Brazil and Argentina, and it used that physical position to become an entrepot, a point for trade in smuggled goods into these economies. It essentially kept down its own import and export duties, meaning that goods would flood in, but they flooded in for one simple purpose, to then be shipped in, smuggled in, to Argentina and Brazil in particular. Uh, they did have re-export taxes. In other words, you're importing this good in, to Paraguay, but you're going to ship it out again somewhere, so you do have to pay a certain export duty. But the export duties were relatively low. And in fact, as we've talked about in other cases, in Paraguay, what happened each week, and still happens today, is that thousands of small traders, merchants, shopkeepers, pour across the border each week on buses, and trucks, coming to purchase these goods. In the 60s, it's particularly cigarettes. Again, this is before the true explosive growth of the consumer economy in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. They would come across the border to acquire the cigarettes and then bring them back themselves, smuggling them into their own economies. This provided a vital source of economic growth and revenue for the state at this time in Paraguay. And we will see other instances of this as we go into the 1980s and 1990s that for many countries, smuggling or piracy of consumer goods provides an important stimulus to the economy. When we look at the collapse of economies in Eastern Europe, places like Yugoslavia with the fragmenting of Yugoslavia after 1989, uh, in many cases, the economies of uh, small countries like Croatia have been sustained for significant time, or at least helped significantly, by piracy and smuggling. You know, when the economy is falling apart in other ways, here's an opportunity. Uh, the capital investment is relatively low. The rewards are high. You can help sustain your national economy for a significant period by engaging in large-scale smuggling. And states, of course, are consciously engaged in this process. You know, they may not, you know, they're obviously not going to issue a decree saying we're now turning our economy into a smuggling economy, uh, 
but they are going to establish rules that say, well, look, it's very cheap to bring goods in, and there's a small re-export duty on it, uh, and by the way, nobody's going to be standing there at the border to see, you know, the fact that these goods are going over into Argentina and Brazil, and in fact, what can we do about it anyways, because the Argentinians and Brazilians are coming over here to buy all this stuff. So this can become an important factor in the growth of developing economies in these years. And, you know, it's not pervasive, but in several countries it's clear that it becomes a de facto part of national economic policy to establish standards which will allow smuggling to flourish in order to keep economic growth going. Paraguay is one of those examples, and we'll come back uh, next time and see it on a far larger scale. Now, this brings us to the other part of today's discussion, uh, that aside from consumer products, the other growth industry and in smuggling was in controlled substances. And what we're going to see is the increasing imposition of controls, particularly by the United States, but also at the international level, to try to control specific substances. And as that happens, we get increased smuggling. It's the same, and let me say, as I begin this, because I'm going to talk about this this week and next week, I am not an advocate of drug use. I am not promoting drug use, nor am I promoting particular drug policies. I'm simply trying to explain to you how this happens, why this happens, why we have problems with drug interdiction, why the war on drugs has had, let us say, limited success, what are the factors that drive the drug trade. And one of those factors is that the more that there is enforcement, uh, the more the risk value of the product is, the more enticing it is for at least some groups, particularly criminal groups, to engage in the trade in that product because the profits are that much higher. Uh, and again, this is not, I'm not calling for legalization, I'm not even going to get into that debate, but the fact is much of the attraction, aside from the fact that you've got an addicted consumer, much of the attraction of the product is the fact that by putting up impositions, by banning these products, and by saying that you'll be arrested, it's the same thing as third world countries saying, okay, we're putting up import duties, uh, we're putting quotas uh, or bans on the import of certain consumer products. It's the same kind of effect. Now suddenly that product's price starts to rise spectacularly. There are great profits to be made if you're willing to take the risk. These same kinds of rules apply with controlled substances as they do with watches, cigarettes, whiskey, what have you. Now, the fact is that as of the early 20th century, there were local drug cultures in various parts of the world. In Asia, we've seen the use of opium. Uh, in China and elsewhere, in Latin America, uh, the indigenous populations living in the Andes uh, often chewed cocoa leaves. Uh, in times, it was used for religious purposes, but it also had a practical purpose, which was uh, for people who were working very hard in cold climates and often had minimal nutrition. Uh, chewing the cocoa leaves helped uh, reduce their appetite and at the same time gave them a certain uh, spark of energy uh, to accomplish the tasks they were doing. So there, were, there was frequently in many societies uh, a common use of certain control substances, but not of the type that we think of today where people are trying to acquire banned substances because in most of these local cultures, use was pretty commonly accepted and enforcement in most cases uh, was fairly minimal in terms of any attempt to ban or control it. Now the United States uh, was exposed more directly to uh, these local drug cultures as a result of the what's called the Spanish-American War, uh, where the United States engaged in war with Spain, uh, particularly over its colony Cuba, occupied Cuba, but also invaded and occupied the Philippines in the Western Pacific. They are the Americans, uh, to their astonishment, shall we say, uh, as reformers, progressives. Remember, these are people who are coming from a society that's in the process of trying to control the consumption of alcohol. Um, we're in the days leading up to prohibition. These are the Americans coming from this environment who see the widespread use of opium in the Philippines. They are, of course, you know, 
startled, <laughs> shocked, uh, even though the fact is that American colonial merchants, or I should say American merchants back in the 19th century from New England and elsewhere, uh, were making a fair profit engaging in the opium trade in China themselves, but that part of our history was sort of set aside. Uh, people in the progressive era in the late 19th, early 20th century are concerned that they want to get substances out of uh, society that people abuse, that seem to degrade their mental capacities, etc. And if alcohol was a target, opium was going to be an even bigger target. As a result, the United States, along with Britain and other countries, called a conference in Shanghai in 1909 to talk about the international drug trade. And these were the first efforts to begin a process by which international control over certain substances like opium and later heroin, etc., would be established. These are just the beginnings of this process. And we've seen England already uh, had already been pursuing a campaign of ending the opium trade between India and China. And indeed, by 1913, that trade, at least the legal trade, had come to an end. And this is the beginning of the process in 1909 where there is international cooperation in trying to set up a framework for enforcing uh, some types of control, at least, if not bans over uh, the use of controlled substances. Most of what's going on at this point are individual efforts like the U.S. and the Philippines, England and China. Uh, on the larger global scale, most of what's accomplished is a reporting by producing countries like Turkey, etc., reporting on how much of certain substances they're producing. Now, there's not exactly a, an ironclad network of enforcement to prevent drug use at this time. We're just getting to the beginnings of that. But of course, as that enforcement process starts to take shape, so will the criminal side of smuggling of controlled substances. This again is a period when progressives in America believe that rational reform can improve American society, get rid of slums, get rid of poverty, and part of those rational reforms are getting rid of substances that people abuse and that tend to degrade them, at least in the eyes of progressives, degrade them morally and uh, in terms of their work ethic, etc. This is what helps lead to prohibition, as we've seen. That same kind of ethic is going to be applied to controlled substances like opium, etc. And in 1914, the United States Paris passed the Harrison Narcotics Act. The Harrison Narcotics Act uh, was the first federal anti-drug legislation in this country. So that marks a major milestone in terms of domestic enforcement of rules against drug use. Now, one of the other things that affects the drug trade here in the United States, which was relatively a casual, let us say, drug trade at this time. We weren't dealing with large-scale criminal syndicates, etc. Uh, but one thing that happens in World War I is the decline of the Asian opium trade. Uh, Asian uh, immigrants on the west coast of the United States. Some of them were addicted to opium, and opium had been brought in uh, from China, well, not from China, well, some degree from China, but from various parts of Asia, uh, into the United States, and specifically the west coast, up until this time. But that trade, as a result of the war, is disrupted. And it's at this time that Mexico becomes a supply source for opium. Uh, there were already opium poppies, you know, a flower that grows, uh, from which opium is produced, uh, growing in Mexico. And these were now being harvest, harvested and processed uh, and shipped to the United States uh, to meet the demand for opium, which is pretty small scale. I mean, we're not talking about large numbers of addicts by any stretch of the imagination. And Mexico is also becoming a source of marijuana shipments as well. Uh, Drug officials generally accept the fact that marijuana use is pretty well confined to Southern California, of course, or else, uh, as many people in the U.S. would say, uh, but also the American Southwest, okay, New Mexico, Arizona, and parts of Texas, and we're also lighting up. Uh, but it's a small-scale trade, and it's, again, casual. It's very much the type of smuggling that we talked about with, early, uh, with the early years of prohibition, of people saying, well, they can make a few dollars, they'll drive a truckload of marijuana across. But it's not a huge consumption at this time, and the people involved in it are simply taking an opportunity occasionally to make some money. There is no highly systematized process for smuggling of either product into the United States, but it is going on. <laughs> 
with prohibition, uh, there was also set up the narcotics division of the prohibition unit of the Treasury Department. So within the larger framework of the enforcement group for prohibition to ban alcohol, uh, there was a subgroup to deal with narcotics, uh, what became uh, in 1930 the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and these are, of course, the origins of what we later come to know as the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, but they have their origins all the way back here uh, at the time of Prohibition. Now, the U.S. government w was making efforts to prohibit the use of substances like opium uh, in the United States and marijuana, uh, but with not a great deal of success. It was clear, for example, in the 1920s, although statistics on drug consumption are always somewhat suspect because, just like smuggling, people usually don't go around reporting uh, the fact that they're consuming illegal drugs. But what we do know is that drug use among federal prisoners in the 1920s, prisoners in federal penitentiaries, was, increasingly, was increasing dramatically. Now, this is obviously a select population, uh, and various arguments can be made about why their usage would be more, would be higher than the general population, significantly higher. But the fact is, the fact that it's growing among them indicates that there is increasing usage, at least among this community, but probably more likely in the larger community as well. Still not an enormous problem, but still it is increasing. Given their frustration with their ability to prevent consumption in the United States, U.S. officials began looking overseas for a solution to their drug problem. Uh, not an uncommon kind of reaction, the same kind of reaction we've seen over the last quarter century. In other words, all right, we're having problems keeping people from using drugs in this country, so the answer is let's stop the drugs coming in from other countries. At this time, Mexico and Honduras were both places where drugs were being shipped in. Some of it is locally grown in terms of uh, opium and marijuana in Mexico, but both in Mexico and Honduras, it's also a fact that uh, Opium is being smuggled in from elsewhere, and then these places are being used as landing points before the product is shipped in or smuggled into the United States. And in addition, uh, there is a growing problem with the use of cocaine. Coca leaves are produced in Peru, of course, among several South American countries. And the U.S. government begins attempts to force these countries to cut off those exports, those illegal exports to the United States. The idea is interdiction uh, is the way to solve the drug problem. The same kind of debate that's still raging here today in the United States. You know, is the uh, problem here or is it overseas? And the reaction from these countries was much the same that the United States got later on, which is, look at, you're trying to dictate to us what our domestic policy should be on drugs. You know, you're telling us we should go out and burn opium fields, etc. You know, but we don't want to do that. We don't want you telling us what to do in our trade. The problem is you have people in your country who are consuming this good. If they stop consuming it, people here will stop growing it, producing it, smuggling it, whatever. So the United States is not very successful at this time, but it does set a precedent for the future where the United States will try to use diplomatic pressure and other types of uh, leverage to try to force other countries to stop shipping illegal drugs into the United States. One of the major products that is among controlled substances that will expand in usage throughout the first half of the 20th century is heroin. It's estimated in the 1960s that somewhere between 60 and 200,000 adult Americans uh, were addicted to heroin. And again, you see the wide range in estimates because nobody knows for sure. We can make estimates based on the small number of people who actually come in and get treatment or get arrested and then try to project that into a larger figure. As far as the source of heroin, um, 56% of the world's production uh, was coming from India. Russia was accounting for 26% and Turkey for 17%. The problem with those statistics, however, is that they're official statistics. In other words, what these governments officially reported to international uh, drug agencies as to what, how much was actually being produced. There were legal uses for opium and for morphine, uh, and I'll explain that connection in a moment. Uh, so they could report that they were producing a certain amount, and that was for legitimate use. But of course, these countries aren't going to report 
what they're producing that's illegal. <laughs> no, the people producing it are going to report it to the government. Uh, the connection between these substances is that the poppy, uh, which is used to uh, produce opium, is reduced to a resin. Okay? Uh, that makes it easier to ship, easier to handle. That resin, uh, when it's refined from opium, becomes morphine. Further refinement takes it from the stage of morphine, which has medical applications, to heroin, which is a highly concentrated version. And the, real, only, the only real purpose of this is for someone who's addicted who wants to use it um, for, because they have become addicted to the substance because of the uh, psychological and physical impacts it has upon them. So there's a direct connection between opium production morphine and heroin. They're all being extracted ultimately from the same poppy. It's just where along the refining process do you stop? What would happen normally is that once uh, the resin uh, was produced, it would be shipped out, uh, for example, from Turkey to places like Aleppo in Syria, to Beirut, and other locations along the Mediterranean. And from there, the product would be shipped on to Marseille. Now, Marseille is a port city in southern France, and its significance was that in Marseille, uh, criminal groups, uh, specifically uh, some Corsican gangsters, and I'll explain their tie in in a minute, had developed uh, the best refining processes for heroin. And this was no small feat because, well, the first stage of getting the poppy to a resin. Uh, isn't terribly constant, complicated. You take calcium chloride and water and boil the stuff, and uh, the uh, non-substantial matter falls to the bottom. You take the liquids and boil it down, and you get the resin. You know, you can do it in a barrel over a fire, but taking the resin and getting it to the point of heroin uh, is a more complicated process and dangerous. You can blow yourself up trying to do it. So this was not a refining process that was going to be readily practiced around the globe. The gangsters in Marseille had developed the facilities to do this and to ship the product out. And because of Marseille being a major port city, closely linked to the Middle East, a logical transit point, that's how the trade had begun there. Uh, the Corsicans, of course, had connections uh, long standing both to France and to the Middle East. Uh, partly because France had had a presence in the Middle East as well, in Lebanon, etc. And they were the ones who essentially became the go-betweens of purchasing the product as it came out of Turkey into the Middle East, and then shipping it and processing it in Marseille uh, for further shipment there from there. Now, their major market is in the United States. There are other heroin addicts elsewhere, but this is the place where you can get the most money for the product, as we will see. And in that marketing process, as they took the resin from Marseille, processed it down to heroin, and then shipped it to the United States, they become connected with the Cosa Nostra, with organized crime uh, in the United States, and particularly in the northeastern United States. Now, here I say the Cosa Nostra versus the Corsicans. Uh, through the 1950s, this is pretty much a cooperative relationship with the Cosa Nostra, the um, criminal syndicates in the United States, particularly in New York City, uh, handling everything from uh, the purchase of the product brought in by the Corsicans and then its distribution and sale in the United States, as well as political payoffs, etc., the things that are needed to make the trade go in the United States, while the Corsicans handle the other end, getting it out of the Middle East, refining it, and getting it to the U.S. About 1960, however, the Corsicans began taking on a larger role in terms of actually operating within the United States. Uh, this was not so much a rivalry as the fact that several leading mafia members uh, were arrested in the late 50s and convicted of drug smuggling crimes and drug trading crimes and went to jail. At that time, many people in organized crime felt that they wanted to step away from the drug trade that it was becoming uh, too much a focus of political concern, uh, penalties for uh, crimes involving the sale and uh, trafficking in drugs uh, were rising. But the largest issue for them was it was you know, too spectacular. Uh, it was attracting too much public attention. And therefore, uh, 
was going to be the focus of law enforcement in the years ahead. These people had a variety of other lucrative enterprises, including prostitution, gambling, uh, control of unions, etc. Uh, they felt that they could leave most of this to the Corsicans. Now, that will vary over time, but the fact is, during the 60s, the Corsicans were taking over more of the actual operation in the United States because of it. As I said, much of this is focused in the United States, and particularly in New York. New York was the heart of the U.S. market, and there were an estimated 31,000 addicts in New York in the early 1960s. Now, the Corsican gangs in Marseille ran their operations much as people smuggling gold, smuggling Swiss watch movements had done, and that is through courier systems. They would send off dozens upon dozens of couriers carrying the heroin in various parts of their body, sometimes in vests too, uh, on airplanes in particular. And they knew that perhaps 10%, maybe somewhat more than that, of these people would be caught. And again, the uh, number of these people were well trained. Uh, sometimes the gangs would even give them sedatives to take just before they got off the plane so they wouldn't be sweating or acting nervously, which are the kinds of things that, you know, if you want to get stopped by a customs agent, stand there, you know, shuffling your feet and rubbing your hands and uh, moving your eyes around and acting like, you know, you're uh, distracted and nervous, uh, they're going to look at you immediately. Uh, of course, that may be your normal personality, but the fact is, that those are the kinds of traits that they look for that they assume uh, someone is nervous because they are trying to smuggle something in. So they would give these people sedatives to try to calm them down and hopefully get them through the process. And nevertheless, at least 10% of them uh, were caught. Now, uh, the drug trade was also being run out of Le Havre, another French city, and there the gangs decided that instead of following the Marseille strategy of sort of send in droves of couriers, knowing that someone will get shot down, the rest will you know, reach their target, their idea was to try to do it in a big score. In other words, ship over a massive amount of drugs uh, in one shot with the idea that you reduce, you know, instead of taking 50 chances that you'll get caught, you reduce it to one. You know, you've got this big amount that you're bringing in. If you can just get that one shipment in, you'll make a fortune. Uh, that kind of operation is what formed the basis for the now famous American movie, The French Connection. Uh, this was the Le Havre syndicate uh, who made this attempt. They did, in fact, uh, use an automobile that was owned by a French TV personality who was coming to the United States. The car was going to be loaded on a luxury line of bringing him to the U.S. And, you know, he was not unaware of what was going on. Uh, the car's bumpers, etc., unlike in the movie, was the bumpers in particular, uh, were loaded up uh, with heroin product. And the idea was, we can get this car loaded with heroin into the United States. It won't be given a second look because it is, you know, a, a well-known French personality, so they'll let it fly through, and we'll get this huge score. In fact, the international drug enforcement groups had learned of the shipment. They were being tracked both by the Sûreté in France and by U.S. officials, including the York City Police, etc. And soon after the vehicle was picked up and taken to be opened up and the drugs removed, these people were arrested, and there we get the famous story of Popeye Doyle and you know, the French Connection. This was part of an ongoing process. You know, it was a big score in this case for the police department, but in fact, any number of such shipments were going on at the same time. It's just that this was one spectacular shipment uh, that was caught, and of course it made great drama because of the sheer size of the shipment but it was hardly the only time that the Le Havre syndicates used large-scale shipments to get their product into the United States. Now, of course, the success of the heroin trade uh, creates another problem, and that is how do you get the money back to France, to wherever the syndicates may want to put it, some international bank account? Uh, by the early 60s, and again, you have to allow for you know, the fact of inflation, etc. Uh, about $15 million a year was being smuggled out of the United States uh, to pay for heroin that was being brought in. Now, at this time, uh, 
uh, money laundering is not that difficult. Uh, unlike today where there are a number of controls on financial transactions where uh, any time you deposit more than $10,000 uh, into a bank account, the bank has to report that, uh, and there are all kinds of tracking devices for money that's being moved within the United States and overseas. Uh, at this time, although drug enforcement officials are aware of money laundering, uh, their control mechanisms aren't that great. Mostly the way the money was moved was that a bogus corporation would be set up in New York, New Jersey, uh, somewhere close by, and uh, it would be, let's say, an import-export firm. The reality is it exists only as a mailbox somewhere, and it has a bank account. So you deposit the money in the corporate bank account, and then supposedly another office exists in Paris or London or Geneva, and the company periodically remits profits or is paying for certain services by wiring money, shipping money overseas, and that's generally how the money was transferred back. Nowadays, that kind of device would be much too transparent. Uh, far more complicated systems have to be used to launder money. Now, on the West Coast, there is also a trade in heroin going on. Uh, in part, Mexico is being used as another access route uh, for European heroin, or heroin that's coming out of Marseille, uh, for a simple reason. Just as in the later years of the drug war, when U.S. officials start cracking down, they know that the heart of the trade is New York. Chicago is probably number two. The places where it's being brought in, New York City, Boston, Toronto, they're going to focus on those locations, on those border crossings, in cases like Toronto, et cetera, uh, to crack down on the trade. What will happen is that when the smugglers see that happening, they'll look for other routes to access, and Mexico becomes one of them. It's got thousands of miles of border with the United States, all kinds of places you can move product across that border. Uh, some of it will go, again, there is some demand in California and elsewhere in the country, but the major markets are back east. So the idea is to get it up through Mexico into the United States and then up to particularly Chicago and then where necessary transit across uh, to New York City. At the same time, Mexico is producing heroin at this time, although uh, its refined product is not nearly as well refined as the stuff coming from Marseille, from elsewhere in France. Uh, in fact, uh, Mexican heroin is brown in color as opposed to white. It's sort of like looking at uh, brown sugar versus white sugar. So Mexican heroin was not considered of the same high quality as European heroin and had a lesser market in the United States at this time. The heroin tra trade in the western United States is still primarily a casual trade, and by that I mean organized crime is not playing the major role in getting heroin into the United States. Uh, it's usually local entrepreneurs, people who are doing this as a business, but they are probably not part of a criminal syndicate at this time. They are engaged in what is essentially petty crime. If it is a criminal syndicate, it's very small scale. In other words, you have small groups of people operating in Tijuana and elsewhere, there is not a large criminal syndicate. It's basically the condition of, in Mexico at this time. Uh, Tijuana is the key point uh, for the West Coast in terms of heroin coming in. And in fact, uh, by the 1950s, you could actually call and reserve your heroin in Tijuana. You would call a phone number, tell them how much you wanted. Uh, they would give you a bank account number where you could transfer the money. You transfer the money. Uh, to that bank account. Once the deposit is made, uh, th you call them back and they tell you, okay, uh, come across the border in Tijuana. There are tens of thousands of tourists coming across every weekend. And they'll tell you, okay, go to re restaurant X, uh, go into the men's room and behind the toilet at 10 o'clock Saturday night, there your stash will be. The beauty of it is, of course, if the police catch you, they're not going to catch the supplier. And, uh, nor can they arrest anybody, you know, what are they going to do, arrest the toilet, you know, for having heroin behind it. So it was almost an ideal system in terms of moving the product. But of course, it's only ideal because it's on such a small scale. You know, it's individuals or somebody who's a local supplier in San Diego or something has a, a few people he sells to. If it were large scale, this kind of thing wouldn't be practical. So 
it works, but it works partly because the trade still is on this relatively low level in the western part of the United States and in Mexico in the 1950s and 60s. Now, there are also Asian producers of heroin by this time. Uh, if we look at Thailand, Laos, Burma, uh, these are places specifically where uh, the poppy uh, is being grown and uh, broken down into resin. Uh, Bangkok was well known as a key shipping area for product coming out of Thailand and also Burma and for shipping that product where else but Hong Kong. You know, if you're trying to smuggle something, Hong Kong is the place to do it in Asia in these years after World War II. Now, another product that is far less important at this time, but of course becomes the focus of an anti-drug frenzy in the United States in the 1980s, is cocaine. Cocaine is considered the rich man's drug. Uh, it was fairly pricey in terms of its final refined form. It's taking coca leaves and refining them down to cocaine. Uh, cocaine had been used in the United States uh, for any number of decades. At the beginning of the late 19th and early 20th century, cocaine was widely praised in medical journals for its uh, stimulative effects for helping people with depression, of course, uh, for helping and improving uh, people's moods and their work production. Uh, and a form of coca leaf was being used even in Coca-Cola at that time, although uh, in later years it was clearly a non-narcotic uh, derivative of coca leaves that was used in Coca-Cola. But Early in the century, it was considered almost a wonder drug until people began to realize its addictive qualities and the enormous impact it could have on people's psyches as well as their physiological health. By the 1940s and 50s, uh, again, it's sort of an elite drug. Uh, because of the price, relatively few people can afford it. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's the drug of preference of people who are, let us say, uh, upper middle class, white collar. Uh, it doesn't have the same stigma as heroin does at this time. Of course, uh, even though you may not be uh, familiar with any heroin addicts yourself, uh, nevertheless, movies like Man with a Golden Arm and so forth depicted you know, the depravity of heroin addicts and their pathetic uh, conditions. And of course, as a smart, say, jet setter of the 1950s and 60s, you don't want to be identified with a drug that apparently is identified with nothing but losers. Cocaine didn't have that stigma at this time, and as a result, again, it has that kind of appeal. In addition to that, there is the fact that, well, heroin, alcohol, and other products are sedative in their effect, tend to lower brain activity, uh, reduce response time. Cocaine doesn't have that kind of immediate effect. It may have certain side effects as you come off uh, the use of it or in between usages. But the fact is that uh, tests show that people who take cocaine, uh, if they're tested for certain repetitive processes, for example, working on a computer, doing some you know, basic responses to computer stimuli, uh, they actually do as well as when they're sober, straight, sometimes even better. The beauty of that is, of course, again, for people who are white collar, middle class, they actually feel as though it's enhancing their performance on the job. Now, whether their judgment is intact anymore is another matter. But unlike an alcoholic who may be hungover, heroin addict who is dozing off and has that drugged up look, you can look like, you know, a million bucks and be energetic. Uh, even as you're taking more and more cocaine, that's the, you know, the old commercial about, you know, I'm working harder to make more money so I can do more coke, so I can work harder so I can get more money to do more coke. It may not be very productive for you in the end, but in the short term, it's a great sales point to middle class people because, they, well, you know, it's not going to hurt you. You know, you can snort some of this stuff and it's not like you're going to go off and, you know, uh, lose your job or something. In fact, you probably going to feel full of energy, happy about it. So it had those kinds of appeals. But again, price at this time kept consumption from spreading very far. Uh, the trade did flourish mostly in the 1960s uh, before the later episode in the 1980s, and we'll talk about that next week. Uh, 
it was mostly coming, of course, from coca leaves being produced in South America at this time uh, that are refined down into the white powder that becomes cocaine. The organized trade in cocaine at this time uh, comes through Cuba and Puerto Rico, and Cubans and Puerto Ricans with connections in New York, and of course there was a good deal of uh, Cuban and Puerto Rican immigration into New York, um, criminal gangs within these immigrant communities provided the connections between South America, the two islands, and of course uh, New York City in particular. The main entry point into the United States, although it's not the main usage point, was Miami. Again, because it's a major port and air terminal for Latin American countries for all kinds of trade into the United States at this time. Again, Mexico is another place where the trade goes on. And of course, there's already a network of drug smugglers, although they're small scale operations. Again, we don't have large centralized criminal syndicates at this point. Uh, these are small networks, but nevertheless, they do exist. They're already dealing with heroin, so adding cocaine you know, isn't that big a deal. So uh, Mexico is another place where the drug will come up because of these connections, and again, because you've got several thousand miles of border with the United States. Another product <laughs> that's coming into use, although it's been in use for you know, the beginnings of the 20th century, is marijuana. Marijuana uh, in leaf form, but also in resin form known as hashish. The problems with marijuana were actually, unlike cocaine where it's high price, uh, it's kind of the opposite problem with marijuana that it didn't have nearly the return uh, value that products like cocaine and heroin did. In other words, uh, the profit margin was much lower on marijuana than it was on these other substances. And the other problem is when you're not shipping it as hashish, you got the bulk problem. You know, you get a, you know it's like you got to load a truck with uh, 50 bales of marijuana if you're really going to get into the business seriously, and that's a little difficult to hide. You know, it's not like a bag of cocaine or something that you can stuff in a bumper or whatever and hope to get through um, the customs officials at the border. So these problems were going to create uh, difficulties for the spread of marijuana initially as compared to cocaine uh, and uh, compared to heroin. Now, in the 1960s, uh, consumption of marijuana exploded. It became closely tied to uh, youth rebellion in the United States, hippie culture, uh, the idea that marijuana, of course, was something that made you peaceful, uh, loving, or seemed to, uh, that it didn't have any obvious side effects. It was not physically addictive, certainly not as cocaine and heroin were, so it seemed to be lower risk, a sort of you know, uh, consumer drug, if you will, and its popularity spread wildly uh, in the 1960s. And indeed, uh, the estimate is between 67 and 68 that about 350 tons of the stuff uh, were smuggled into the United States. So uh, this is a period of explosive growth for marijuana. Uh, primarily because of youth culture and because of those qualities of marijuana that seem to indicate that it was not the kind of danger to people that heroin and cocaine seem to represent, particularly heroin. Now, there are a variety of international producers of marijuana, Morocco, Lebanon, Pakistan, and of course Mexico. For the United States, Mexico is the key one because 80% of smuggled marijuana was going to come from Mexico. Uh, of course, in later years, uh, as enforcement became stricter as we get into the 80s and 90s, domestically grown uh, marijuana was going to take over as the prime product, so uh, marijuana smuggling becomes less significant in later years. But about 80% of the trade in the 1960s is coming across the border from Mexico. And indeed, uh, at this time, technology once again steps in and helps play a role because now one of the major ways of bringing marijuana across is going to be in airplanes. Uh, there is operating in the 1960s what was called a marijuana air force. Uh, dozens upon dozens of private planes being flown across this incredibly ex extensive border uh, to bring marijuana in, uh, landing in small fields uh, that peppered Texas and Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, sometimes, you know, makeshift fields landing on an old mining road, for example, to drop it off. Uh, worse comes to worse. Uh, they would 
tie up the bundles in such a way that they could simply fly to a low level and simply drop them on the ground. You don't even have to land and take the risk of being caught. Uh, there was a huge influx of the product because, of course, it got past the major problem at that time, which was how do I get a truckload of marijuana across the border? You know, if I want to go across at Tijuana or El Paso, et cetera, you know, it's going to be hard to hide this stuff. Uh, so airplanes became a major means by which they could bring the product into the United States. In 1968, uh, customs officials finally responded to the marijuana Air Force by buying their first Cessna. So this was the first effort by the control officials to up the ante and say, okay, we'll match your technology. We're going to get up in the air with you. And of course, in later years of the drug war in the 1980s and 90s, uh, the Air Force will be brought in, all kinds of elaborate uh, tracking devices, night scopes, et cetera, are going to be used to try to uh, halt that trade. But by then again, marijuana was far less significant. What's being brought over by then is cocaine. And of course, what they're doing is simply picking up on the technology and the routes that the marijuana smugglers had been using ever since the 1960s. What we've seen here today are two phenomena that have some connections. First is the question of what I've deemed consumer goods, and they can range from, as we've seen, watch movements to uh, cigarettes to gold and diamonds and whiskey. How these products become major international smuggling items after 1945 and up into 1975 because of the protectionist regimes in much of the world that exist after 1945 as all kinds of countries begin to pursue industrialization and therefore want to limit to a significant degree import of consumer products. Facilitating that pr whole process are a number of other factors that we've looked at. The other half of the story is the growth in the smuggling of controlled substances. We've been looking at heroin, we've been looking at cocaine, we've looked at marijuana a little bit. And here there is a similarity in the sense that we have growing consumer markets, particularly marijuana represents a consumer market of millions in the United States by the 1960s. And here too, although for very different reasons, governments are inhibiting the movement of these imports, if you will, into their countries. In one case, it's because of economic development and the desire to industrialize. But the other factor, but here too with drugs, we're dealing with a similar situation that, yes, they're inhibiting them, but for a very different reason, because they believe that these products are harmful to their citizens, that they degrade people morally, physically, etc. But the effect is the same that for, in both instances, when you put up barriers, whether it's total bans, high tariffs, etc., you suddenly enormously increase the price of that product, you increase the risk factor, and with it, the profits that can be made by smuggling those goods. You know, if tariffs are only 1%, you know, yeah, you can smuggle, but is it really worth it? You know, how much profit can you make when the difference between smuggled and illegally imported goods is only a 1% tariff? If it's 100%, now there's a huge opportunity for profit. The same with drugs. Okay? There are very different motives for why states want to keep certain products out, whether it's a, a wristwatch or cocaine, very different motivations. But the ultimate effect is quite similar. And as we will see more extensively next week, as governments intensify their effort to clamp down on drugs after 1975, they will also increase the criminalization of these drugs. We've already seen some of that happening, particularly with the heroin trade coming out of Marseille and La Havre. As the years go on and the attention focuses on cocaine and a war on drugs is declared, criminalization will increase because only criminals are going to want to take the risk of going to jail for life or 20 years or whatever, and usually only criminal organizations will have the capital to counter interdiction methods uh, used by the United States and other countries. So we will get more involved with extensive criminal syndicates the more enforcement focuses on these drugs. That's already happened with heroin. Cocaine and marijuana are lesser problems, but as cocaine particularly becomes a much larger problem in the 1980s, enforcement will increase and so will the involvement of 
large-scale criminal organizations. Looking at the first set of products, the sort of consumer products in this period, here are the major facilitating factors that help make smuggling so extensive. First of all, third world protectionism, what we talked about last week, import substituting industrialization, the fact that countries use a series of devices, tariffs, licenses, quotas, etc., to control the import of consumer goods. Those have the effect we just talked about. They raise the price of these goods, they raise the risk, they also raise the profit margins to be made by smuggling them. Secondly, new technologies. Airlines being used far more extensively for moving passengers and cargo after 1945. We get you know, tens of millions of tourists moving uh, on airlines by the 1960s, as we saw last week. That technology facilitates the movement of products. Gold, wristwatches, these are products that are going to be heavily smuggled on airlines uh, during the 1950s and 1960s. Also improved telecommunications, more widespread long distance calling, teletype machines. These make it possible for smugglers to communicate and precisely coordinate their movements and therefore make it easier for them to circumvent the efforts to interdict the smuggled products themselves. The existence of an increasing number of free ports. Uh, Hong Kong has come up with every smuggle product I talked about today as a smuggling center. Why? Because it's one of the leading free ports of the world, and particularly in Asia. Time and again, we see places like Ceuta, Panama, etc., emerge as key smuggling centers because they are free ports, means no import duties, no export duties, and limited enforcement of inspections of products, particularly going out of these areas, and therefore ideal places, particularly when they're positioned close to highly protected economies, such as in South America, China, and elsewhere, perfect for moving these products into those protected economies for smuggling. And then, of course, the existence of one-party regimes in so much of the developing world. One-party regimes in places like Ghana, India, and elsewhere meant limited attempts to control government corruption because of the lack of a viable political opposition. That meant bribery of officials was bound to happen. Connected with all of this, too, there is the effort to rationalize the illogic of bureaucracies trying to enforce elaborate protectionist systems, licensing systems that were almost impossible to effectively utilize were being rationalized by smugglers to get enough product in to keep the economy going. And then the other side of the coin that we've been looking at today is drug prohibition. And of course, drug prohibition, as it expanded the Shanghai Conference in 1909, the first federal drug law in 1914, and from there, as enforcement increases, so does the opportunity for smuggling because profits are higher, risks are higher, and as risks grow, criminal groups will become more deeply involved in this process. And of course, this whole process will expand through much of the globe as an international anti-drug campaign expands during the second half of the 20th century. We'll see more of both of these phenomena next week when we look at the period after 1975.